Vasishta continued, When the mind is established in dispassion and in holy company, and when through the study of the scriptures there is disinterestedness in the pursuit of pleasure, one does not long for wealth and treats even the wealth that one has as dry dung. Well, actually, dry dung is quite a resource. It's used for insulation, for cooking, and other things in India. But I suppose what this means is you don't regard your wealth as, as useless. You regard it from a purely utilitarian point of view, because we need some degree of wealth. But the point is we're not getting caught up in neurotic anxiety about wealth, about ever accumulating wealth. I'm reminded of the saying of Jesus about the payment of taxes. You render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, you need to deal with money. You need to deal with wealth. But you, you don't invest anything in it. You don't invest any sense of your own being in your wealth. And this is the thing, isn't it? People relate their own status to the amount of wealth they have. They, their sense of being is tied up with wealth. And this can have tragic consequences. There was a case a while back of a businessman. He murdered his wife and daughter. He murdered the horses and dogs that the family owned before killing himself and setting his mansion ablaze because his wealth had evaporated. Apparently they were a very loving family, but he could not see any future without his wealth. His whole sense of being was greater than the love he had for his family or for his animals and for his own life. It was very, tra very tragic. But this is why it's important just to regard your wealth as dry dung, because you're not going to invest your sense of being in dry dung, are you? He treats his relatives and friends as co-pilgrims and serves them appropriately at the proper times. So this is an important point because we're often told that family relationships are the cause of suffering. And the usual assumption is that you should abandon them. The usual assumption in the Indian tradition anyway is that you abandon your family in order to pursue your spiritual practice. But here we're told that you treat your relatives and friends as co-pilgrims and you serve them appropriately at the proper times. So you carry out your family responsibilities. He is not attached to seclusion, gardens, holy places or his own home to fun and frolic with friends or scriptural discussions as he does and he does not spend too much time in any of these. You can get attached to all these things. If you're a spiritual seeker, a spiritual practitioner, then you might find it nice to go off and live in some community spiritual community. Nothing wrong with this. But are you getting attached to it? Can you not see yourself surviving in any other situation? You need to ask yourself that question. And be careful with scriptural discussions. The whole point of scripture is to remind you of your nature, to turn your attention back on itself. And if you're going to get involved in discussions, well, what's the point of that? You're just going to get into a nice interaction, perhaps a very enjoyable interaction, where the spiritual teachings have been reduced to some kind of social bonding mechanism. This is why you have to be very careful with spiritual groups. It becomes another common interest group. You might as well go to a group, a poetry reading group or chess group or something like that or badminton or something or salsa class if you want social bonding but to use the script to use the spiritual teachings as a basis for social bonding is really quite inappropriate he rests in the supreme state 
The supreme state is that which is is that which is the supreme state is not something that needs to be str striven for lifetime after lifetime. The supreme state is that which is. So <laughs> it's not some rarefied sphere of existence which we have to purify ourselves in order to access. The supreme state is that which is. How about that? Division in it is created by ignorance, and this ignorance is false and non-existent. He who is firmly established in the self and who is undisturbed like a sculpted figure is not swayed by sense objects, I and the world, time and space, knowledge or void. These, though they may continue to be, are not experienced by the knower of truth. All these things are, are notions. One should salute that son in human form whose personality is devoid of rajas, that's restless action or impurity, who has transcended even sattva or purity and in whom the darkness of ignorance has no place at all. This restless action or impurity is the restless tendencies of the attention, the attention which is always seeking to lose itself in something or always allowing itself to be hijacked into something. So this one is one who has transcended even purity. There's no attempt being made to be pure. And purity in this sense is when the attention is resting in itself. This becomes its natural abode. And it will leave that abode when it needs to, in order to do what needs to be done. The state of one who has transcended all division and whose mind has become no mind is beyond description. Adored by him day and night, the Lord bestows upon him the supreme state of nirvana. And the Lord is this pure mind. It naturally bestows its benefits to the one that rests in it. The Lord is neither far nor inaccessible. One's own illumined self is the Lord. From him are all things, and to him they return. All things here worship and adore him at all times in their own diverse ways. By thus being adored in diverse forms by someone, birth after birth, the self is pleased. Thus pleased, the self sends a messenger for one's inner awakening and enlightenment. So we're getting a particular story here. That if you have been reverent in the past, if you've worshipped divine forms in the past, then this is your reward. The self eventually reveals itself. But we have to be careful. I mean, this worshipping of God in some external form or concept is here being regarded as something which eventually pays off. But sometimes it's mentioned in the Yoga Vasishta that it's worthless. We're we back in chapter 30 of section 6.1. It tells us that the external worship of a form is prescribed only for those whose intelligence has not been awakened and who are immature like little boys. When one does not have self-control, etc., he uses flowers in worship. Such worship is futile, even as adoring the self in an external form is futile. So, that's what it says back then. But here it's saying that eventually you'll wake up the messenger thus sent by the self is Vivika or wisdom. It dwells in the cave of one's heart. It is this wisdom that brings about the gradual awakening of one who is conditioned by ignorance. The one that is thus awakened is the inner self, that is the supreme self whose name is Om. I think eventually what happens is there is awakening. We live in a time now where we have access to these wonderful teachings and there are many people who've realized the essence of these teachings. You can see there are videos online. In some ways we can see ourselves as living in a time of, of great awakening. So all the generations of the past have somehow brought us to this point.